think we should be very open to the Holy Spirit just leading us to pray, loved ones, if he wants to do that. So will you be aware of that? And I'm just going to uh, listen to him. So I'll start speaking anyway, and we'll go as long as he wants us to. But I think I've sensed tonight that uh, what are the words of man? You know, what most of us need tonight are the words of God directly to our own hearts. I, I sense, too, that a lot of you don't wait on God. Uh, us, me too. We don't wait on God. We don't wait on God. And that's why we don't hear him. And that's why often our lives are as empty as those who don't proclaim to know anything about God, you know. Because uh, we talk about the emptiness that they feel or the emptiness that we felt before we ever knew Jesus. But many of us just have the same sense of discontent uh, today. And many of us are going from, really, it's a bit like the junk food that we talk about. You know, we, we go from, from junk food to junk food. And we go from meeting to meeting and service to service, from preacher to preacher and book to book. And really what we need to do is wait upon the Lord in our own quiet times at home. Now, I don't know how many of you really get through to the Lord, you know, really get hold of God. I don't know how many of you do. How many of us, you know, we need to say it about ourselves. How many of us get hold of God? Or how many of us do that morning prayer time to satisfy ourselves and our conscience and to make us feel that we can wave the banner and trust the Lord for the rest of the day. But we don't really wait upon God. We don't really, therefore, hear what he is saying to us. So we're not really living the lives of spiritual men and women. We're actually living the lives of at least soulish men and women and, and possibly even unregenerate men and women in that we're just living off each other. And you remember that's what we said, the greater part of the world is doing. It's living off each other, really. And that's how we all live. We, we live off each other and each other's feelings and each other's comments. And somebody says something nice to us and we feel happy. And somebody says something unkind to us and we're all cast down. And many of us live that way even now. We live that way before we came to know God, and we live that way now. And yet we do say we're born of God. Of course, a, a spiritual man or a spiritual woman is not simply one whose spirit has come alive and who has had some contact with God, but a spiritual man or a spiritual woman is one who lives dependent on God's messages to them and God's opinion of them day in and day out. And I don't know how many of us live from thrill to thrill, or how many of us live by what we have to look forward to this evening, you know. I don't know how many of you are thinking, now what do I do after service? And it's going to be good because I have so-and-so to see after service or it's going to be good because I can go home and see that program on television that I was interested in seeing. So that's some little thing to look forward to before I go to bed. Or I've just changed the bedclothes and I look forward to getting into clean sheets tonight. <laughs> or I have tomorrow morning to look forward to, or I haven't tomorrow morning to look forward to. But I wonder how many of us live by those little thrills and those little kicks. And how many of us are still really living like the children of this world? Because, dear love them, that's all they have to look forward to. They have to care about what their boss thinks of them or what their friends think of them in order to have any sense of self-worth at all. And I wonder how many of us live that way, you know, from thrill to thrill or from kick to get kick or from little adventure to little adventure. And of course, I don't know if you see it, but that's what makes us so parasitical upon each other. You know, we're parasites. We live off each other. That's what m makes us incapable of giving life or love to others. 
I don't know if you've met a person and they've seemed to make you fe feel better somehow. You somehow feel stronger or you feel more loved after you've met them. And you have a sense that they're stable, steady, at rest. And they have time for you. And they actually do love you. And they are giving to you. And you've sensed that about them. And yet you yourself do not act like that. You're pretty restless, pretty half-contented, and usually trying to get something, a little more of something from somebody or from tomorrow or from the car ride home or from something else. But you're not at rest. You're not at content. You're not at peace. And so you're not a source of life. You're actually a source of emptiness. And because you're always looking for something from other people, they sense that you're kind of draining to them. And uh, they don't go away from you built up. They go away from you. That's another person who wants something the way I want something. Now, loved ones, it is possible to come to such a place of dependence on God alone for your friendship and for your love that you can be at rest and at peace. And when people meet you, they can say, that's a contented woman. That's a man at peace. They sense that. They sense that person is satisfied. Not because they have all the money that they want, not because they have a great job, but they have a heart at peace. That person is at rest. That's nice. I'd like to be like that. And that comes, you know, from at last dying. There's no other way. There's no other way. It's at last dying to meeting Mary and having tea at her and Martha's house. It's dying to even the little bit of excitement and thrill that that might give. It's dying to hoping that they'll respect your teaching or they'll respect you or they'll follow you or they'll even simply refuse to hurt you. It's dying to that. It's dying to any thought of a little more comfort than you have. Just a stone to lay your head on, maybe a little pillow but it's dying even to the hope of anything softer for your head. It's dying to that kind of thing. And for most of us here, it's dying to things that really we all think are very legitimate to have. And they are in the eyes of the world. You know. It's legitimate in the eyes of the world to look forward to having your own girl or your own guy. The, the mistake, of course, is, is laid bare for most of us after we do marry. Because we all have the idea that that girl or that guy will give, give us the comfort and the sense of approval and the sense of recognition that we need. Of course, you find that everybody's the same. And human beings, even the very best of them, are unreliable. And she doesn't always give you that sense when you think she should give you it. Or he doesn't always give you that sense when you think he should give you it. Of course, many marriages just settle for a kind of a standoff, compromise at that point. But it's interesting, they're still looking to each other for it. They're still looking to each other. And so there's little rest in each heart. They're still, in a sense, demanding from each other. And really, you know, the spiritual man or the spiritual woman is the one who gets all that from God. And I know that's a killer. And honestly, 
I have tried to fiddle it every way, to say it some other way, and some other way that is less harsh or less hard. But the victory is either complete or it's not at all. And if you're looking for a little comfort from God and a little from your roommate, you may as well look for it all from your roommate. And if you look for a little recognition from your peers and your colleagues at work and a little recognition from God, you may as well forget God completely. It seems that that's what Jesus was trying to get over to us, you know. Look, if you're united with me, in a death like mine, you'll be united with me in a resurrection like mine. And you'll experience the fullness of my Father's glory and my Father's love upon your head. And you'll experience all the joy that I have at this moment in his presence. You'll experience it completely if you will unite with me in a death like mine, if you'll stop looking to other people and other things. That's what a spiritual man or spiritual woman is, you know. It's a person who receives everything they need from God through their spirits. And then that works out through them. And of course, most of us are not living that kind of life. We're living a life with a big emptiness inside because we live our life from people and from circumstances and from events. And we're trying to fill that big circle in the middle with security and happiness and significance, and you just can't get it filled. It somehow doesn't fill completely. And you always feel an emptiness and a discontent because of that. And yet you're always grabbing for more of it from everybody else. You know. Loved ones, I, I would just share with you tonight, we shared last Sunday that coming into a relationship with God is having your spirit made alive and the Spirit of God dwelling in your spirit. I would just share with you tonight, a spiritual man or a spiritual woman is not one who has that Spirit of God dwelling in their spirit. A spiritual man or a spiritual woman is one who has that Spirit of God flowing through their spirits, out through their minds and emotions, and out through their bodies to the world. And that's what a spiritual person is. It's a person who has everything they need and who are continually giving out what they have received from God. And that's why I started this evening. This isn't the sermon I was going to preach at all. But that's why I started this evening by sharing with you that it seems to me that the heart of our problem is that many of us have come into some relationship with God's Spirit we wouldn't be here tonight, you know. You wouldn't even be here unless you had sensed God's Spirit giving you a hunger for Him. But loved ones, I think where we're falling short, many of us, is we're not spending time with His Spirit alone, you know. You're just not spending time in prayer with Him. And so you're not really getting satisfaction from Him. And I'm not talking, you know, about thrills and emotional highs. I'm just talking about a love relationship where you sense God loves you and where you sense he knows you. And that can only come if you're willing to wait upon him. And I just know in my own heart and life that I'm an entirely different person when I've waited upon God. I don't go to my wife wanting something more from her or to you all wanting more from you. I go content and satisfied. I don't care if anybody gives me anything. I'm content and satisfied. I don't care if you think I'm good or think I'm bad. I don't care if people criticize me or what they do. I'm just satisfied. I don't care whether the money is going well or badly, the job well or badly. There's just a contentment and a rest. Now, loved ones, that's God's will for every one of us in this room. And until you have that, the Christian life is really, what Mark was hinting at, a terrible burden, just a terrible burden. Because you're trying to be like Jesus, but you don't feel like him inside. And I, I just feel tonight, you know, that the message God wants me to share with you 
is that the very basis of being a spiritual man or a spiritual woman, I was going to go on to talk about spirit and soul and all that kind of thing, but the very basis of being a spiritual man or spiritual woman is that you spend time with your dear father and you get from him what you need. You know, if you say to me, well, brother, that, that is my problem. I, I get all cast down when somebody criticizes me. I do. I, I do care about what people think of me. Well, what should I do about that? And I know some of you have said to me, maybe I need a little healing in my emotions. Loved ones, I don't care if you quote me and say what a rotten one-track creature he is. You've got to die. That's it. You've got to die. I was the same, you know. I was the same. I think Irish and Americans have that very much in common, that we are very impressed by what people think of us. You know, there's a great immediacy. Maybe that's why one, I think the reason I enjoy being in America is Jesus wants me here. But I can see that very often we have that in common. We're very aware of what people think of us, and we want people to think well of us. And that's why maybe so many Irish and Americans are comedians, because you have to sense the way the audience is responding, and you play to the audience. And loved ones, I was just as caught up in that as anybody in this room, you know. And if you, you can't say, oh, but brother, if you knew how sensitive I am to people's opinions, if you knew how I find myself unconsciously playing to the gallery, if you knew how many things I do because I think other people would approve, loved ones, that's what I was like. And then I saw the whole message that I could never rise into the freedom of caring only for God's opinion unless I was willing to die to what men thought of me. And I don't know what it is for all of you, you know. I can tell you some of the things. I, I came to the States, it must be about 15 years ago, and you know the way your mum and dad, well, my dad was with Jesus, but my mum was still alive. And you know the way your parents want you to do well. And I knew my dear mum was back there, you know, wanting me to do well, as every mother does. And I remember that was one big thing I had to die to. And Jesus made it very clear to me. Look, my mum was standing in front of me as I was crucified on this cross. And to her eyes, her son was an absolute failure. Now, that's what I died to, and that's what I took you to the death of also. Now, are you willing to die to what your mother thinks of you? Are you willing to die to whether your parents and then your friends think you're an absolute failure? Loved ones, that's a question of the will, you know. That's a question of the will. You can decide that once and for all in your will. You can. And what I did was, Lord, I, I want to know absolutely what this will mean to me, so will you show me it in every color of the rainbow? And the Holy Spirit was so good, you know, and showed me all the people, you know, who thought you were a golden boy or think you're a golden girl, you know, and, and want you to do well. And then, of course, eventually it comes down to the huge, massive, swelling self, you know. It's not the parents at all. You know, we use them as an excuse. It's not the parents or the friends. It's us. What do we think of ourselves? And actually, we think we're worth a lot. And we think we should succeed, and we have a right to succeed. And envy really is not any feeling that the other person is better than you. Envy is thinking, being annoyed because the other person thinks they're better than you. But you're absolutely sure that you're really better than them. And it's the swelling self inside that makes for envy and jealousy. And it's the swelling self's opinion of itself. And loved ones, that's really what Jesus calls us to die to, you know. And really, we wouldn't be worried at all what anybody thinks of us if we accepted once and for all that what God said is true, 
in Romans 8 and 7, there is no good thing in us, you know, no good thing in us. And when you at last accept that, that there is no good thing in us, and that anything in us that is to be good must come from the Spirit of Jesus coming into us, then there's peace in regard to what people think of you. But, loved ones, I would share with you that real freedom and rest comes from at last dying to all that input that we receive from each other. And, oh, there's such a freedom and a liberty. There is, you know. I don't know how many dear wives are, are under the pressure of wanting to please their husbands. It's good to love your husband, but it's a shame to be in that position where you wonder, does he think I'm good in this way or good in that way, or am I up to what I should be? Oh, it's such a freedom to accept. I'm useless. I'm hopeless. Lord Jesus, whatever you want to do through me, that will be satisfactory. And if it isn't satisfactory to other people, Lord, it's satisfactory to you, and I accept what you want to do in me. But loved ones, there's a great freedom, and deliverance comes when you're satisfied with your God, you know. I don't know how, how many people you're looking to for satisfaction beside your dear Creator, but uh, some brother prayed over here, you know, earlier in the service that there will come a time when you will be just alone with your dear Father, and so will I. And all of us won't be here. And I saw a lovely BMW in the car park this morning, and there won't be BMW motorcycles, and there won't be cars, and there won't be Baskin Robbins ice cream, <laughs> and there won't be even the smile of our little baby, and there won't be fall leaves. There won't, because all those are just shadows of what our dear Father is. And he's crying to you this evening, Will you get to know me? You've seen the colors of the rainbow. They're nothing compared with the colors in my eyes if you will just spend time with me and get to know me. And he says, you know, the most loving touch your mom ever gave you when you were a little child. It's nothing compared with the tenderness of my love towards you if you'd stay with me for a little while, if you'd just get to know me and wait upon me. Will you wait upon me? And loved ones, I feel that that's where we're falling short, you know. Do you know how long it takes you to run down after you've closed your eyes and closed your ears? Sometimes it takes us about an hour or two hours to run down, really. Because all the little emotions are whirling around there and the little minds whirling around, and we can keep that thing churning for hours. And it takes time to let that run down and to set our minds upon God. And oh, if you'd only do that in prayer time, you'd begin to put your first foot on the way to being a spiritual man or spiritual woman. But I just sense tonight, you know, it's silly for me to talk about other advanced stuff when really many of us here have little experience of God as our total satisfaction. And I think the real tragedy is that Many of you say in response to me when I say that, well, that's because I, I, I can't get that feeling in my prayer times. I can't get it. I, I mean, I've tried, but I can't get it. But loved ones, we're all in the same boat, you know. We're in the same boat. It's simply dying in your will to getting it from anybody else and looking to God and saying, Lord, if I can't get it from you, I want it from no one else. It's regarding yourself as dead as far as everybody else is concerned, and then it's spending time with God. It is, you know. It really is. And if you say to me, well, can we do anything through the day to help? Well, yeah, I think uh, almost immediately you get up from your seat this moment. There are a hundred thousand little reflex responses that come into you to please the person beside you, you know. Or, or to look out and see if that person's looking at you. There are almost a hundred thousand little responses that come because we've programmed ourselves for years to that. And so, yes, as soon as the Holy Spirit says, stop it, then stop it, stop it. That won't solve the whole depth of the self that is looking out for other people's love, but it'll begin to move into obedience. Or tomorrow morning, when you think, when you have a little anxiety as you begin to think of getting up out of bed in the morning, and you have a little anxiety, 
trace it down. See if it's connected at all with what he will think of you when he has read that assignment and is about to give it back to you. See if it's anything to do with what will this person think of the piece of work that I did last week. Or see if it's at all connected with how is so-and-so going to treat me today. And as soon as you're conscious of it, say, Holy Spirit, I can see it. I can see that I'm a slave to what other people think of me. Holy Spirit, will you show me in what way I have to be willing to die and to face the consequences of my death with Jesus in, these, in regard to these people? Very often, you know, in connection with office people, it's, uh, are you willing for them to think you're a fool? Really? Are you willing to think for them to think you're a fool or to think you're incompetent or can't do your job? Are you really willing for them to think that? Very often at school, it's connected up with the old curve. And are you willing to be thought dumb? Are you willing to be thought not one of the brightest ones, not one of the most sophisticated ones? Often those of us who have trouble in our homes with our relatives' uh, attitudes, our husbands or our wives, God is saying, are you willing to be thought not so great by them? Are you willing to be thought maybe a, a rather a failure by them? And it's a matter of coming to the place where you say, Lord Jesus, I'd rather die with you. I'd rather be alone with you and have only your approval and the approval of the whole world. So Lord Jesus, as far as I'm concerned, and the world is crucified to me and I'm crucified to the world and I'm dead and I don't care what they think of me. Lord, only your approval counts. And then, loved ones, to spend time with him, you see. Because it's no use coming to a place where you're willing to die with Jesus and then not receiving from him his love. Then your last state is worse than the first. But you'll rise into his resurrection if you turn from other people and their approval and you'll turn to Jesus only. And, you know, if you pushed me and said, Brother, do you mean there's no place for being hurt? Well, you know, I, I know... I've tried every way to twist and contort myself and keep my salvation and say there is a place for being hurt, but there is no place for being hurt. You know? And if you say, but, but brother, isn't it human to be hurt? It's fallen human and carnal human to be hurt. It's not spiritually human to be hurt. And if you say to me, now, brother, are you ever hurt? I say, if I ever see anything that looks like hurt, I say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that this fellow Ernest O'Neill was crucified with you. Lord, thank you. Thank you that it is not for me to register what you alone are to feel. And it's you, Lord, that count. It's not me. Loved ones, there is no place for hurt. I know, I know there are a thousand little hearts. No, there can't be a thousand. But there are 200 little hearts here who are pleading, just let me be hurt a little, please. <laughs> Loved ones, it isn't so. And I know, uh, you know, hundreds of you say, but don't you think we need to be healed a little from our hurt? No, no, no. A dead body can't be hurt. You need to accept that you were crucified with your dear Savior and that you have been raised and are now part of that dear family sitting at the Father's dining room table, eating his food and seeing his smile upon you. And so what does it matter what all the little flies rolling along the floor think of you? You're up there sitting at his dining room table with the candles lit, his son on the right-hand side, the Holy Spirit on the left, and they're shining their love upon you. And what does it matter what these little flies around your feet are saying? That's it. And there's no place. Oh, that fly is nibbling at my toe. <laughs> He's hurting me. Well, no, it isn't so. And it's, it's possible if you will see that a spiritual man or a spiritual woman is one who lives from the inside out, from what they get from God, and not from what they get from people. And there's only one way to come to that. Only two ways, actually. One, you die physically, and then you're free completely. They can't do anything to you. Or the best way is die spiritually with Jesus and die to what other people think of you. And then God begins to make you a spiritual man or a spiritual woman, a person with some, some content in their lives, some peace, rest. Do you want to question me at all?
push me into a little permission for a little hurt, <laughs> brother. <laughs>